Welcome, everyone, um, from my home office in Saarbrücken all the way up into the world. It's great to have an opportunity to talk about battery technology, digitalization, and green technology with you today. And um, I'm very fortunate to chair this session today. Unlike other panelists, today we will have a first a presentation segment. I will lead the way into it. Um, and then afterwards, we have an exciting panel discussion that I'm truly awesomely looking forward to. Now, of course, I'm here um, on also honored by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, so please make sure if you are a battery enthusiast, if you already charged up, sorry for the battery joke about that, um, definitely check out the themed collection on battery research with RSC. And if you're uh, not just a battery enthusiast, but a battery researcher, you may want to consider also submitting some of your works to Energy Advances, a new journal that we launched, completely open access. And we're looking forward to your contribution to this or any other RSC journal. And of course, there's not just the RSC, there are other journals as well. So if you're a scientist in the field, please contribute to the community, give back and engage in dialogue, publish your results. All right, today, uh, what leads us together is battery science and technology going digital and going green. Now for the green, you will see a lot of green colors later on, but uh, it is of course a, a digital age event, not just because of the COVID pandemic, but also to enable more participants throughout the world um, that uh, we have this seminar here, this panel discussion in a digital form. So it's just fitting that we talk about digitalization as well. Of course, uh, you're not just joined in to hear me rambling about my enthusiasm about battery technology, science and technology, but of course you are of course fortunate as I am as well to have a fantastic group of people who will be talking with you today, including myself, of course, um, just chronologically. So that's why I mentioned myself first. I'm very excited about the presentation from Jennifer Rupp, um, from Matteo Biancini and Anwar Satar. So topic-wise, we will cover anything from new materials that I'll be quickly addressing the others, of course, as well, onto cyber-physical material discovery and machine learning cycles for solid-state batteries, followed up by exciting, exciting um, activities related to electrodes on the cathode side from raw materials to electrodes and devices, and not just making devices and learning about chemistry is important, but also what to do in the end, the sustainability, closing the circle of circularity. That is where I'm excited to hear from Anwar Satar from University of Warwick, more about battery recycling and the big question, can we meet our targets? Now, I will not introduce much more about the panelists because who can present and introduce themselves better than themselves? So I'm looking forward to hearing from the panelists when they present step-by-step step later on. Exciting to have them all of you here and it's a great commitment to this panel. Thank you. Now to kick things off a little bit, as I mentioned before in the first part, before we go through the different um, Q&A aspects, we'll be talking about 15 minute segments on the, on the topics that I just outlined. And since I'm the first to start, because I already have started talking as the moderator, your guidance counselor a little bit through the event here, um, I want to take the opportunity to talk about new materials, new material discovery, this uh, little astronaut, cosmonaut or taikonaut hopping from one Prussian blue electrode material to a next one and asking him or herself, what's next? So, the big question that I want to address in the first segment is about do new materials make better batteries and what's the context of it? Now, when we talk about new materials and new discoveries, in a lot of places around planet Earth, there is this common sense that new equals better, that new is better than old. However, um, this, of course, is fueled by consumer electronics, by the fast advancement of technology that we've been visiting in a breathtaking speed over the last 
um, decades especially, but you know, we still don't live in caves still, we basically visit other celestial bodies, and for that reason, technology has never ceased to rapidly evolve. And you see that in many aspects, like riding a car rather than a horse, um, but also in mobile communications, getting smaller from the bones that you had in the 1980s, 1970s, all to the smart devices we have today. And without making advertisements for Apple, there are many brands of, of mobile phones on the world, but just for the iPhone series, I've just grabbed the capacity of the battery that is inside giving you power. Still, it is quite inconvenient that in the end of the day, you still have to recharge, but it has paced up. It has really improved technologically wise from the first generation to the 10th generation from 1400 milliamp hours, which is the charge storage capacity to a value roughly double that value in 10 years. And at the same time, the, the displays got larger, but the devices got much more compact and much more powerful. So it's not just getting more capacity in to have a longer runtime, but at the same time, keeping up with technological advancements and requirements for computational power, screen light, and brightness. And when you open up, um, I don't take any warranty if you break your device by opening it up, but whenever you open it up, you will see that a large portion of the device inside is composed of the energy storage unit, the, the, the battery here, the lithium ion technology involved, and um, the latest generation of the um, most computational strong system in the iPhone 13 Pro Max, we also have a record-breaking 4,000 milliamp hours. So it's really um, an increase that must be enabled somehow. So why didn't we have 4,000 milliamp hours uh, in the devices 10 or 20 years ago? And there's a reason for it. It's technological advancement and of course also costs. And this is not new to the business. It's not new to batteries. Here you see a Leclanché cell, which is basically a zinc manganese oxide system. Um, the electrolyte was swimming around. It was basically a, a glass jar uh, that I always am happy to show to students in our lab because we have a couple of those cells laying around. It's a clunky bulk system and you couldn't imagine to attach that to a mobile application. So ever since uh, a century long um, development from this first Le Clanchet cell to use a different electrolyte to make it much more compact, not this marmalade class of floating liquid, but having a more solid system, non-leaking and in compact form. The form factor was a, one of the most striking advances as well in addition to the different in chemistry. So the alkaline battery, it hasn't changed much visibly because it's the form factor AA, AAA, and other ones that you basically know not what chemistry is inside, but you have, you know, a torch or something else that you want to fuel with energy, then you only need to know is a AA, a AAA, what other form factor do you need? But technology didn't stop there. And it's, for me, it was this Sputnik moment when, um, when like two or three years ago, this one showed up in online shopping recommendations of me because of um, <clears throat> the advances that are intrinsic to battery technology. We see the swap, not of the form factor, that's an established category now, but of what is inside. The consumer doesn't really care if they are zinc inside, metal oxide, manganese oxide. It's not so relevant, but it's relevant what you can use it for, how much it costs, and how safe it is. And for convenience, interestingly, now you can find those AA, AAA batteries and other form factors from various brands and, and regions around the world that come in with a plug-in USB port already. So that's no longer the chemistry, which you cannot see from the outside, but it's a USB-C rechargeable lithium-ion battery. And this illustrates, it's not just changes in the form factor in the application, getting more charge that you can run Angry Birds more quickly, or that you have a brighter display when you watch some YouTube videos. But at the same time, it is also what is inside that matters to scientific interested people, and of course, our scientists as well. And there's a large, large 
choice portfolio that you can draw inspiration and technological adaptation from. I don't want to go too much in detail, but there are materials that are based on metal oxides, metal sulfides, spinels. There are elements like silicon and phosphorus, carbon, germanium, antimony. You can draw from a lot of materials and they collapse into different categories where you have conversion materials, you have intercalation materials, you have other systems electrochemically differently in their energy storage performance and capacity. Of course, where you want to go in those charts is the upper right corner of performance. Yeah, because you want to go to high voltages because high voltages constitute high energy storage and of course also high capacity. So what you want to have is a lot of energy storage capacity available to you. And doing so in a way that the materials are long living. You don't want to exchange the batteries ever too quick often. And when you have a mobile phone today, good luck with exchanging the battery yourself there not designed to do that anymore, which brings up interesting um, questions later on for the panel about battery recycling and battery extraction. But when we draw from those existing materials, uh, remember this little astronaut hopping from one Prussian blue asteroid to another, um, you also may ask, what's at the horizon? What new materials are there? What new combinations there are? And I myself, I was fortunate to be part of a group discovering at Drake's University in 2010, a new material group. That's, uh, that doesn't happen very often in scientific life. So I was very fortunate to be at Drexel, then uh, Joel Gugotzi, Michel Bashum, and Michael Magwip. And discovered Maxine's, which is a large group of two dimensional metal carbides, carbonitrides, and nitrides, with this breathtaking, beautiful architecture that just shouts out loud, please insert ions into me, or put other materials in between those highly conductive layers to capitalize that for energy storage. And these elements that you can use in those layers like titanium carbide or molybdenum, vanadium, nitride, they already herald the problem of what to choose, like the ice cream parlor problem, what to choose as the material you want to enjoy for your application. And specifically for that material, initially it was needed to use hydrofluoric acid, which uh, any chemist will tell you you want to stay away from unless you're interested in dissolving um, certain otherwise undissolvable materials. Now, these materials, new materials like Maxine's, you can use them as they are. You can use them as a new generation of 2D materials with the added flavor beyond just carbon, which is the only element, of course, in graphene. But you can also transform them into metal oxides. You can transform them in metal sulfides. But this now brings the question, well, you have a new material, which as a nanomaterial scientist, you more adequately should call a milligram science business because the amounts you will get initially are very limited. And then you just use it to make something that you can do by another technology. So here we already have this conflict about new material discovery and how does it compare to the state of the art and is it worth doing beyond just the sake of exploring new things. And this extends to also modifying other materials. For example, we, we investigated without going too much in detail, some metal oxide systems, niobium oxide. We introduced on the nanoscopic level, these beautiful flowers, some crystal structure defects, and suddenly the energy storage capacity went up. Are we still higher than other materials? No, but it's an interesting design strategy to improve performance, but is it worth doing it? Just because something is new, does not allow you yet to predict the scope of its impact. And this is also where digitalization, digital twinning, having a material, describing it digitally and simulating properties before you go in the lab. This is a, you know, like um, when a new country is discovered, you still need to step on the different land, looking around, exploring it. Now we can use digital technologies to explore things without being there yet, to do predictive material research and directed material design. And that's one of the things that will be like the guiding star, in my opinion, for 
the material research landscape. But even if you have that, you did your homework, you did all the research, you already have a material that is very promising, there still is the nasty valley of death. At the same time, you may, when you talk about the um, valley of death of technology between innovation and commercialization, uh, you may want to look a little bit back in history, especially at here at COP26. The point here is, well, has that happened before? And the answer is a resounding yes, of course. And it might surprise you that New York City was suffering from horses. Well, more precisely, what horses left behind. There was the so-called great horse manure crisis. And this is inevitable if you have a public transportation system optimized and carried by animals. Something comes out of the animal at the end. And if you have 11,000 cabs and all are horse powered, they produce a lot of manure. And it's interesting to see that in those days, the electric car, and more specifically, before the electric car really even was more coming profoundly developed, the internal combustion engine car. The thing that we're trying to get rid of very hard now, that was championed as the passing of the horse, dispense with the horse, dispense of odor. That's the sanitary health crisis solution. Interesting, because when we look at cities today, we'll see that internal combustion engines indeed produce odor and have a negative outcome. But why are we not using just new battery materials for electric cars? Well, the answer is even before they had lithium ion batteries, they did that. There was the 1903 electric Porsche. And of course, there was the infamous 1996 EV1 from General Motors. But you didn't see a large market share of them. Well, there were high, high costs of the system. There was a low return of investment. And in the end, there were even copyright and lawsuit issues. And when you Google around a little bit, the EV1, um, the electric car in the 1990s, long before the Toyota Leaf or the BMW electric cars or any other companies you want to cite here, they were withdrawn because they were not sold. They were just lent. They were rented to people in a lease. And after GM made the decision to discontinue this technology, they were withdrawn. In some cases, even they <laughs> required the police to come and take the cars back. Now, if a technology is successful, has to do with a lot of decisions on our marketplace, not just with new material discoveries. And it has to do also with cost. And this is just from a recent article in EES, the cost per kilowatt hour of energy storage versus the time. And you see on this logarithmic scale, the strong decrease. And I just have grabbed a few numbers. In 1992, we were at 6,000 US dollars per kilowatt hours, dropping down to 2020 to 137. At the same time, the capacity for global installations in production went up. At the same time, when you scale, you may want to look what elements are useful. And you can look around. There are useful elements in the periodic table to enable certain reactions, conversion, and decalation. But you should also have a very close look at its abundance. Is it a material that is abundantly available? And if so, is it also available at low social negative costs and environmental impact? Now, this brings forth the question, is a new material by definition also greener? Well, I mentioned already vaccines as a new material, which can be produced in a green or at least sustainable technology fashion, yes. But initially, we didn't do that. Initially, HF was used and still is very commonly employed for the synthesis. So what about green and green washing? It's just giving us material the appearance of being green. And to do that, you need to consider a lot of factors. It's not just plain and simple say, ah, just use carbon. Well, you can use carbon derived from oil. And that no longer may be a sustainable way. So it's not just the element you pick, but also the way you produce it. And when you vet, the lithium ion battery, for example, compared to lead acid, the good old fashioned car battery, you will see that it really depends how you use it. If you use a material, a system like lithium ion battery LIB here for more than 0.7 years, it becomes green. But a lithium 
a lead acid battery, you need to use for at least two years before the invested energy turns lower compared to the recovered energy from the storage. So it has a lot to do with how you use systems and the longevity, the lifetime of it. And this brings also forth that when you have the choice between something being transported from far, far, far away to your place, or if you can use locally grown batteries or locally manufactured batteries, that really is a much more sense-making sustainable aspect to it. So if you want to have any take-home message for the green activity, sustainability, go greener, go lightweight, go local, and appreciate progress because there will not be the most sustainable battery tomorrow. Um, batteries don't grow on trees. And even if they do, you need to harvest them and transport them. And that really illustrates it takes a village. You really need more than just one component, more than just one process. It is something that employs everything from how do we manufacture it? How do we employ more sustainable materials? How do we predict the properties? How do we optimize the synthesis? How do we build the cells? And what do we do in the end with it? Um, in the interest of time, two quick announcements. First, please, um, dear participants of the panel um, meeting today, um, you have the Q&A button down there that you can click to ask your questions. And I'll be having a vivid look at what questions come in to direct them as soon as we are through the panel to the um, panel. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Matteo for his 15 minute presentation. Uh, about um, cathodes specifically and the way from raw materials. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Volker, for the introduction. And uh, thank you to the Royal Society of Chemistry for having me today. Um, so today I'll try to just uh, um, bring you in a short journey, really, from the raw materials to especially the, the manufacture of cathode materials in industry and uh, how then these are integrated into, into the cells. Um, as a short introduction, I think uh, if you are here uh, tuned in today, you know how lithium-ion batteries uh, have changed the way we use electric energy, how they um, enabled a complete uh, portable revolution by putting a, a smartphone in everyone's pocket. Uh, <clears throat> that's mainly uh, how lithium-ion batteries transform consumer electronics, um, which is a market where there's really focused on high energy density uh, batteries uh, at a higher cost, but uh, with a lower need of long lifetimes. Uh, a second important market for batteries is the um, stationary storage one, uh, where again, there's different requirements and this will be a very interesting opportunity for the future for uh, giving the chance of a second life to use batteries. Uh, but the main uh, market today, the one, the biggest, the one with the highest growth expected is certainly uh, the electric vehicle market. And it's also the most demanding one in terms of cost uh, and performances. Um, I just wanted to have a, a real quick look at the numbers here to, to give you a flavor. Uh, there's different projections out there about the kind of fleet of electric vehicles we will have, but uh, this is a recent one from Nature this year, where basically around the year 2030, we'll have some 30 million uh, electric vehicles on the road. This will mean, or new electric vehicles actually, so this will mean that the, uh, in Europe only, uh, the uh, battery manufacturer will have to scale to values of uh, uh, reaching terawatt power per year. So this is really a very large battery capacity. And it's a huge challenge, of course, because it means that, uh, I don't know, some like 50 gigawatt, gigawatt factory or so will have to be uh, installed and, and, and built. And it's also a big challenge for the chemical industry because in terms of CAM, so cathode active materials, this means that we have to scale up from what we have today to more than uh, 2 million tons of active uh, cathode active materials uh, production. And uh, this is really a great challenge. And it was already highlighted by Tesla at the battery day that most likely battery factories cannot scale fast enough to, to keep this pace. So it's really an exciting time, but also a great responsibility to be able to, um, to scale really uh, fast enough. Um, so I promise you uh, a journey from, from the raw material. So here is a, a nice slide that uh, I thank BSF for letting me use. Um, when we want to make a battery that goes in a car, so there's really a long value chain that we have to consider from the mining of the metal ores and their upgrading 
Then we have typically refinery where um, metal salts are produced. These are typically sulfate uh, of nickel, cobalt, manganese, and so on. And then uh, there's most likely, mostly the chemical industry who uh, prepare precursors, which are typically hydroxide. And again, these cathodactive materials, which are lithium transition metal oxides normally, uh, or lithium, lithium transition metal phosphates in some cases. And then these materials go to battery manufacturers, which are for the most part actually in Asia. So uh, China, Japan, and South Korea are the biggest player by far. And then these prepare the battery cells, which are then taken by the OEM, so the uh, car manufacturers to prepare the battery packs. And of course, we must today close the loop, recover these battery packs eventually, and uh, recycle whatever we can. Uh, so especially the precious metals and the lithium uh, and go back to the, uh, to the initial stage by, by getting back these materials. Um, you know, what I'm um, was experiencing and also uh, what the SF as a company uh, knows better is really the manufacturing process of the cathodactic materials. And so I want to give you a flavor of how just this making this, this one material can be extremely complex. So as I told you, we start from precursor uh, sulfates typically that need to be dissolved in a solution. And then there's a precipitation or co-precipitation step where we make um, transition metal hydroxides. And this is an incredibly important step because it's what gen will generate the morphology, especially the secondary particle, but also primary particle level of this PCAM, the precursor of the cathodactic material. So this hydroxide will have a given morphology, which is decided in, for the most part during the precipitation. And then uh, we have some additional steps of drying and sieving and washing. And then we've made this precursor and we still have no lithium. So we need to uh, add the lithium to make our, our uh, cathode materials. And so you can do this in a sort of pre-mix step in a, um, in a machine, which is called, for example, a rotary curl. So you can add your lithium source and your dopants eventually and your PCAM. And uh, you have a first heating step. And then you have a second heating step, the main calcination, which is done at a temperature, let's say between 700 and, and 800 or 900 degrees Cs uh, in a roller hertz cone, which is again, uh, like one of these very big uh, machines that you see here at the bottom. And then there's a third major, uh, so we, now we made our lithium transition metal oxide. Now there's a third major part, which is still the, the final post-processing, the washing and coating, which is really needed to stabilize the material. And I will, uh, I will uh, tell you more about this. So this is also a very important uh, step. So as you can see from going from the initial surface to the finalized product, it can easily take the uh, manufacturing process, each of which need to be optimized. And um, I have only one slide really discussing one real material because it's something that's close to my heart because I work on it uh, in the Bella Lab in Karlsruhe in the last three years. And it's also focus of great attention in BSF. So this is lithium nickel oxide. And that's because, I mean, this is a material that was known in the nineties already. Uh, it's, it's, it would be a dream material, but it has uh, uh, too low stability. So it's not really uh, stable enough thermally, electrochemically. So people made the NCM, the, the nickel cobalt manganese material, by substituting nickel out and putting something else in. Uh, but this uh, comes at the expense of lower, uh, lower capacities, lower energy density. And so now with the demand of high energy batteries for automotive application, we need to go back up to uh, towards the nickel oxide. And that's what's happening. Now we have in most cattle materials in the market around uh, 60 to 80, 85% nickel. And what we did instead was take a top-down approach to start again from the lithium nickel oxide and look how we can stabilize it by uh, small modifications of the structure. And so if you take a bare LNO, bare lithium nickel oxide, this can easily have 245 milliampere hour per, milliampere hours per gram. But the uh, cycle life before it, it, it eats 80% of its uh, initial capacity is only about 100 cycles. Then one can do doping. So work can do elemental substitution of small amounts of uh, substitutional elements that need to be homogeneously distributed, as you can see from these uh, TM images here. And you can already uh, dub double the cycle life. And then what you absolutely need is also a coating. So as I mentioned before, you need something that will protect your surface from unwanted reactions. Um, and this coating needs to be also highly engineered. So you don't only want to cover the uh, surface of the secondary particles, by, uh, but ideally you want to infiltrate the primary particles as well and be able to cover each and every uh, primary particle to fully stabilize the material. So as you can see, by doing this, we have already quadrupled the, the cycle life. 
and giving up only a small amount of capacity. And of course, uh, this is still ongoing and improvement of the materials continuing and hopefully uh, something very close to Alino will uh, eventually be a commercial material. Um, and I wanna spend a few more words now on really this coating process because it's something that really shows you how the, the cathode, the material does not have to be conceived only in itself, but it needs to be uh, understood and thought of uh, in the context of the battery. Um, so in a lithium ion liquid classical cell, um, this material will not be really uh, very stable in contact with the liquid electrode. There's a lot of uh, processes that can happen that will deteriorate the performance of the cathode. And therefore you need this coating, which is typically uh, just a simple oxide, it could be an alumina or titania, or can be something more advanced like a lithium niobium oxide or a lithium zirconate. And these can have different functions. It can protect the cathode material from uh, HF attack. And this HF is generated in the cell typically by small amount of residual moisture that can be uh, can sneak in into the cell. Uh, it can help hinder transition metal dissolution. It can help hinder the gassing, so the, the oxygen evolution from the cathodes at high state of charge. Or it can even hinder uh, to some extent the volume change of the, of the cathode material during cycling. So it's really important uh, in order to stabilize uh, these uh, materials. And not only in the classical liquid cells, but uh, as uh, Professor Rupp already showed you, also in solid state batteries. It's really even more important in solid state batteries because uh, most of the solid electrolytes, especially the sulfide, have a very limited uh, stability window. And therefore, uh, you need to stabilize both the anode and the cathode with the appropriate coating that will allow you to have uh, some electrochemical operation without the continuous deterioration of the solid electrolyte in contact with the cathode. Um, this is also uh, something that um, I like it makes you realize how the cathode material and the uh, target performances in terms of energy density need again to be uh, thought of in the context of the full cell, or at least in, in both uh, in, the, in the context of both electrodes. Um, and I want to take the example of a spinel material, a so-called LNMO. Uh, you you have, can see the formula here. This is a material which has a particularly high voltage. It's about 4.7 volts, but uh, somewhat lower capacity than the classical NCM compounds that are uh, in every uh, electric car right uh, today. And so if you look just at the gravimetric uh, energy density of this LNMO uh, at the material level, you will see that uh, it's at most comparable with a uh, uh, past generation NCM material, the 111 or, or eventually the 523, depending on, on the cutoff that you use. Uh, but volumetrically, it is worse. And this is what you see uh, in this plot here. So um, the, the LNMO is here on the left and the NCM materials are here with higher uh, volumetric energy densities. However, if you consider the fact that, of course, you need also a negative electrode, you need an anode, which uh, to make it simple, to make it uh, the, the most well-known and most used anode today is graphite. The graphite is a low, has a low density. So when you consider the full, uh, um, well, not the full cell level here, what I have in this plot is actually the two electrodes. Uh, in LNMO, since you have a lower capacity, so the energy, the high energy is brought to you by the high voltage, not by the capacity, then you don't need to balance this capacity with a lot of graphite and a negative electrode. Therefore, you will not be hit negatively in your cell level uh, performances by the presence of this graphite. And so if you look here, then uh, at the cathode plus uh, graphite uh, values, you will see that the LNMO is uh, very nicely uh, comparable and competitive with the uh, lower nickel and CM materials <clears throat> and just slightly uh, below the, the more uh, cutting edge and CM811 or even beyond. So uh, this really shows how the, the um, design of the battery and the choice of cutter material needs to be also considered uh, thinking of, of the anode as well. I will skip recycling because I'm sure we're going to talk about it later. And I want to have my last two slides on a topic which is also uh, important to me, and it's the topic of sodium ion batteries. Uh, so it answers the question somehow, how can we uh, take advantage of what we have learned in the uh, last two or three decades on lithium ion batteries uh, and try to make more sustainable uh, batteries? You know, the interest on sodium ion, which is a technology where basically you uh, have the same cell design, but you use sodium intercalation instead of lithium. Um, 
uh, will allow you to use the different materials. And the interest in this technology already started in academia about 10 years ago. Uh, you can see how the publications really rose. And um, then startups came in different parts worldwide. And recently, just this year, even a huge player like CATL in China announced their own first sodium ion cell coming to market. And these were the performances they announced about 160 watt hours per kilo. So why is it so interesting uh, to make a sodium ion cell? Well, first of all, you could use aluminum in both current collectors. So you would get rid of copper, which is already expensive. You can use sodium instead of lithium. And sodium is much cheaper, much more abundant, and doesn't have this huge price fluctuation that we've seen on lithium in the last few years. Um, the the design, design of the cell is very similar to lithium ion. So we could use uh, basically the same production lines. Um, but it's also different, so it allows it allow us to also design different cathode materials, which may be, uh, for example, uh, having no cobalt, less nickel, and be, for example, manganese rich. There's also some drawbacks to be fair. Uh, some we can really do nothing about because they're thermodynamic, so we lose about 300 millivolts uh, because of the redox couple of, of sodium not being as negative as the one of lithium, and also there's a higher molecular weight of sodium. So we're going to lose also some energy density there. Uh, but at the same time, there's also uh, the problem that we cannot use graphite at the negative, which is bad because uh, hard carbons that we have to use instead have typically uh, low, um, even lower density, so lower uh, volumetric energy density. But at the same time, graphite is also a rare resource, uh, which is not really available in Europe. So it might not be that bad if we have to ditch it from our sodium ion battery. And so I think uh, to conclude, uh, sodium ion also have really the potential to be a low cost uh, sustainable technology uh, comparable to LFP, so the lithium iron phosphate uh, battery that have regained so much attention this year, thanks to Tesla putting it into the model trees. Um, and maybe for application not as high end as the ones that we can answer with the NCM materials, but definitely sodium ion can match LFP uh, cells. And so given the proper uh, interest from industry, I think it's uh, a really promising technology. And with that, I give back to, to Volker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matteo. Um, it's truly exciting to see that the challenges of making batteries um, don't stop, and especially the transition towards more sustainable technologies going away from lithium, which of course makes Anwar's job a little bit more difficult if there's no lithium, lithium ion batteries, and if there are no lithium ion batteries, how to recycle them. So without further ado, please, Anwar, please take it away. We're looking forward to your recycling related 50 minutes presentation. Thank you, Volker. Uh, first, can you hear me properly? Or... Okay, good. Hi guys, uh, my name is Anwar Sato. I lead the battery recycling activities at WMG, which is a Warwick manufacturing group at the University of Warwick. Um, I will just share my screen. So give me one second, please. And right, so the title of my presentation is uh, Battery Recycling, Can We Meet Our Targets? And the reason I chose this uh, title was mainly because um, the battery recycling uh, legislation is changing. And so what I want to do is get, introduce you guys to what the new legislations are and potentially how we can meet them. Um, so some of the things I'm going to cover today, uh, talk about the legislations, um, talk about battery components with respect to recyclability, talk a little bit about the battery recycling processes, um, and then of course ask the question, can we meet our targets, and then give some conclusions. So when batteries come to the end of life, so uh, when an electric vehicle comes to the end of life, or any batteries really, they must be recycled according to the local or national regulations, legislations. Now, in, the, in Europe, I, I noticed that you know, the, this is a worldwide audience, so uh, I'm going to be focusing particularly on the UK, but uh, this also applies to the EU as well, because the UK and the EU have similar regulations. Now, in the EU, the batteries are recycled under the battery directive. And essentially what the battery directive is, it sets out the minimum standards that the nations must uh, achieve when it comes to certain things. Uh, so for example, battery recycling. And then the local, uh, or, or the nations within the EU, which unfortunately the UK is no longer a part of, but the nations within the EU then set those uh, targets and they can actually go beyond those targets, but they can't go below those targets. Now, essentially in the UK, batteries are recycled under the waste batteries and accumulator regulations. 
uh, and the that legislation sets into law that the producer is responsible for the collection of batteries. They have to provide outlets for uh, for the batteries. They have to transport the batteries to a recycling site, and they have to pay for the recycling costs as well. Now, of course, we're all talking about lithium-ion batteries, and lithium-ion batteries uh, at, at the moment, the way the current legislations are. Uh, they have to be recycled uh, to an efficiency of 50%. Now, I'll explain later on what that 50% is and why it's, uh, you know, it's quite a challenging target to achieve. Now, these legislations are being up <coughs> updated, and um, the next slide will cover that. Okay, so what's happening in the EU is because the legislations are being, or, or the legislations are being updated, actually, the, the EU and the UK as well, because you have to adopt them. These are some of the most stringent, legis stringent legislations in the world. So um, if you look at China and North America, you know, the other two uh, big markets for lithium-ion batteries, China has their own legislations, but they're not as uh, comprehensive as the ones that are coming into uh, in Europe now. And in North America, they've hardly got any battery legislations uh, other than sort of take back and uh, things like that, yeah. So I'll just quickly go over these. Um, so at the moment, we're in the process of adopting these legislation. So there's been quite a lot of uh, back and forth between the industry and the people who are writing these legislations. And we're getting to a stage now where they're going to be adopted. So from 2023 onwards, uh, there, there's going to be a QR labeling of battery packs. So each battery pack will have a QR code, and then that will tell you uh, sort of the chemistry of the battery, how much it weighs, how to recycle it, etc. So it'll have some information on there. And from 2024, is when the, um, the carbon footprint the carbon footprint declaration must be declared for these battery packs. 2025 onwards, this is where you know, sort of the recycling part comes into it now. Um, the recycling efficiency increases from 50% to 65%. And also what, uh, another thing that they introduce is uh, recycling efficiencies for certain metals as well. So at the moment, for example, you don't have to recycle any of the lithium uh, within the battery packs. And um, in fact, many battery recyclers don't. But from 2025 onwards or 2026 onwards, because it comes on the last day of 2025, uh, you have to recycle 90% of the cobalt, nickel, uh, copper, and 35% of the lithium. And then you can see, you know, there's other legislations that come in. But then from 2030 onwards, that 65% increases to 70%. And the target for each metal increases as well. But interestingly, what also comes into effect is um, from 2026 onwards, uh, sorry, from 2030 onwards, is that you have to have a minimum recycled content of cobalt, lithium, and nickel in every new cell that's placed on the market. And um, that's basically today's presentation is going to cover something like that. So these are the targets, and can we meet them or not? And then from 2035 onwards, uh, the minimum recycled content per cell increases, so increases with 20% cobalt, 10% lithium, and 12% nickel. Okay. So um, th this slide just summarizes the, uh, the battery recycling targets. So as you can see, now one thing that's uh, really important to consider is what do we mean by recycling? Now, different battery, uh, different EU directives have different meanings when it comes to uh, bat when it comes to recycling. But for batteries, a component is only considered recycled if it can be sold as a product. Now, this is really important. So, um, a lot of these battery recyclers, what they will do is they will advertise their recovery efficiency, and there's a diff distinction between recovery efficiency and recycling efficiency. So recovery efficiency is the percent of a material that's recovered at the end of a process. So you may put a thousand kilograms of material in, and if you can get 700 back on the other side, that's a 70% recovery efficiency. But of course, the material that you get, it's not a product, it's just something that you collect at the end of the process. And so only when, it, only when you process it enough that it becomes a product, does uh, the recycling efficiency kick in. Okay, so again, I did say I'm going to talk about the UK. So this chart, what it does is it shows the UK needs uh, in terms of battery production. Now, um, if we assume that each UK uh, battery is going to be 20 gigawatt hours, then one gigawatt hour produces around 3,333. Uh, oh, sorry, what, what, if we take the Tesla Model 3 battery, which is the NCA 
21700. It has an energy density of about 300 watt hours per kilogram per cell. Now, if we take that, then we can say one gigawatt hour will be around 3,333 tons of cells. So a 20 gigawatt hour factory will produce about 67,000 tons of cells, which is you know, a huge amount. Now these, these gigafactories, they produce about 10% waste. Um, and so each gigafactory will produce around six to 7,000 six or 7,000 tons of uh, waste material per year. Now to put that into context, um, one of the largest battery recyclers in Europe, uh, Yumiko, they recycle, I think something like 7,000 tons of batteries per year. And this is a lithium ion battery recycler. And so, you know, just a small gigafactory, a 20 gigawatt hour gigafactory will produce enough material to feed a whole recycling plant. Now, by 2030, the UK aims to have something like 60 gigawatt hour worth of production. And so this will be something like 201,000 tons of um, you know, waste produced from the gigafactory. Uh, sorry, 201,000 tons of cells produced. And the waste for that is about 20,000 tons. And again, you know, this is about three uh, Yumiko plants worth of waste. And so it's a huge, huge amount of waste. Um, what about the end of life uh, from vehicles? So you've got two sources of waste in uh, battery recycling. You've got one that comes from end of life vehicles and you've got one that comes from uh, you know, waste from production facilities. So if we look at the electrified uh, vehicle sales, now I say electrified vehicles because uh, you know, the PHEV and, uh, and the HEV or hybrid electric vehicle, they contain an engine as well. Um, we can see that uh, you know the sales projections are that uh, electric vehicles will or BEVs BEVs, you know by 2035 will almost exclusively be BEVs, and the UK sells around in a good year around 2.2 million vehicles per year, and if we look at the age distribution of vehicles coming to the end of life, we can then sort of map out what the uh, tonnages are going to be for end of life battery packs, and in 2035. In the UK alone, we're looking at something like 150,000 tons of battery packs. And of course, it's not 150,000 tons of cells, it's 150,000 tons of battery packs, uh, which about normally about 60% of a battery pack is cells. Okay, now of course, um, not all batteries are the same. So when it comes to recycling, uh, you know, the, the value in the material is really important and the value is determined by the, the metals at the moment. And so batteries themselves, they're designed according to the need. So some batteries, for example, they are high power batteries, such as the LFP, and some have high energy capacity, such as the NMC. And if we look at the composition of the battery, we can see that uh, you know, about 10 to 12 or 13% of a battery, depending on how much cathode material is in there, is actually oxygen. So if we look, if we go back to that 70% uh, recycling figure, if you think you know, third, uh, ten, more than 10% of a battery is made up of oxygen, then it, it makes that 70% figure very difficult to achieve. And of course, you know, as I explained a bit more, you'll see that you know, it's actually very difficult to achieve. Now, I mentioned earlier that the value of life depends on the material makeup, and by far the most important factor for this is the cathode makeup of this, and particularly four metals, um, or three metals in the cathode, so the lithium, the nickel, and the cobalt, but also the copper as well. And together, these four metals account for about 90 to 95% of the value in a cell. And now what's interesting, of course, is that for LFP chemistries, the lithium ion phosphate, you don't have these metals. You have iron, you have phosphorus, and you have fluorine. Uh, and uh, sorry, you have iron um, and you have phosphorus and you have uh, lithium. Now the lithium is obviously has some value, but the, um, the iron and the phosphorus are very, very low value. And so these cells are a lot more difficult to recycle than the NMC cells. So what determines the recyclability of a material? Well, actually, um, there's about four or five things that determine the rec uh, recyclability of a material. So the most important thing is the value. So almost every single recycler will target the most expensive material first. Now, Obviously, the higher the value, the more 
it's sought after it is. So cobalt, lithium, nickel, copper, those are the most valuable materials in the lithium ion battery, and those are the ones that people target. The next um, <clears throat> important thing is volume. Now, of course, the value of a material may be low, but if the volume is high, uh, you know, the quantity is high, then it makes up for it. So recyclers will target high volume material. Um, then it's uh, purification. So how easy is it to separate this material from the other materials that it comes with? Now, recycling is of course the opposite of manufacturing because manufacturing is uh, manufacturing a compound, putting different materials together to make, uh, to make a product. Recycling is the opposite. In recycling, you're breaking down that material uh, or you're breaking down that compound or that product to get it back into its uh, original materials that it was made from. So uh, the ease of purification is another thing that determines how uh, recyclable a material is. And then of course, you've got property retention. So when you do, when it does go through that process of recycling, does it keep its properties? You know, do, do the properties change? So if we take plastic, for example, uh, once a plastic goes through a recycling process, um, it no longer has the same properties that it did when it was uh, a virgin plastic. And so it always, almost always goes into a lower grade application. And the reason why metals are so recyclable is because metals keep their properties. They're also easy to purify, they have high value and they have high volumes as well. Now, the other thing of course is legislation. So if the legislation states that you have to recycle plastics, then you have to recycle it, people will recycle it. Um, now, when it comes to the cathode material, I mentioned earlier on that the four metals, and you can see the, the price of these metals per kg. And the lithium is, uh, lithium is sold as lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. And if we take lithium carbonate, the price at the moment is about $26 or $27 um, per kg. But lithium carbonate contains about 19% lithium. So the price of lithium itself is uh, very high. And then what this chart shows here is the price of the cathode material versus its constituents. Now, obviously the higher this blue bar is, the more recyclable that material is. Um, so for things like LMO and LFP, you need a different type of recycling process, uh, more like direct recycling where you're reconstituting the material makeup of the cathode rather than recycling the um, cathode, uh, the, the constituent makeups. And so, what about the recycling process? You know, what do they, what are they, what do they look like? Well, essentially you have two recycling processes. Um, you've got shredding and material separation and you've got pyrometallurgical. However, before you get to this, um, you know, if you can imagine you have an end of life EV, you should remove the battery, you dismantle the battery, discharge the battery. And then of course you'll have uh, production waste from gigafactories. Uh, production waste can be in battery form or it can be in, in uh, sort of uh, battery components or materials, cathode, anode. Now, shredding and material separation uses uh, mechanical means to cut open the, the, the cells and reveal the material inside. And once you expose the material inside, you can then carry out different separation processes. So, um, for example, there's a difference in physical properties uh, between plastic and uh, metal. There's also differences in between different metals as well. So for example, iron, you can separate easily from other metals by use of a magnet. Um, and so you'd use those type of processes, density separation, magnetic separation, eddy current separation. You separate that materials out into different streams. Now, shredding and material separation, these processes, they give high recovery efficiencies. Uh, but of course, some of the materials that you get at the end, they may not be recyclable because they don't meet the, uh, you know, the sort of the criteria for recyclability, or there may not even be a market for the material. So a lot of the material that comes to the end of life uh, or that's recovered from lithium ion batteries, it's difficult to sell into the market. Uh, graphite being a, a good example of this. Now, part of metallurgical processes, on the other hand, um, they use high temperatures to reduce the metal oxides. So the pyrometallurgical processes specifically target uh, cathode oxides. Um, the, the, you know, I guess the advantages of these is you get a very consistent product at the end, which is a, um, which is a molten metal, which you then can uh, recover hydrometallurgically. The problem is, of course, you have to add a lot of additives to it and you produce what's known as a slag, which is a mixture of different chemicals that you don't want. 
And this slag, it contains reactive metals such as lithium, uh, aluminium, and manganese. You're of course also burning off the electrolytes, the plastics, and the graphite, and it produces large volumes of gas, which require extensive cleaning. Um, and so, you know, th those are the two main processes that are currently employed to recycle lithium ion batteries. Uh, they, uh, they each have their own advantages and disadvantages. All right, so what about the recyclability of components? Well, I've just give, uh, and how hard is it to achieve the 70% recycling rate? And you know, how is it even calculated? Well, if we start off with a ton of material, we put it into this process, of course, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna lose some material. So your recovery efficiency will probably be about 85%. And then, you know, you have to sell that product to uh, downstream customers and each one of them will have uh, their own recycling efficiency. So you have to take those into account as well. You have to take your own into account as well as those downstream. So to achieve this 70% efficiency is really difficult because at the moment, for example, the graphite, there's not much market for recycled graphite. Um, there's also not much market for the organic carbonates that you recover from the batteries that go into the, that go into the electrolytes. And so to achieve that 70%, you have to essentially recover almost everything that's uh, in the cell. And that's very, very difficult to do. Um, so what about the UK's uh, recycling demand? You know, how much recycling metal uh, or recycled metal would the UK need in 2030? So if we look at the lithium, you need 4%. Um, so in 2030, we've got the, uh, we know the demand from previous slides and uh, I've calculated that you need something like 6,000 tons of lithium per year in the UK. Now, 6,000 tons of lithium is, is a very, very large amount of lithium. It's actually more lithium than, for example, a lithium mine that's currently being opened uh, in Cornwall. And so that mine would not be able to supply the, the lithium demand in 2030. And if we say 4% lithium, then that's 240 tons of lithium, uh, of recycled lithium that we will need. Um, so how many vehicles do you need to recycle in order to get that 240 tons? Well, if we take an average battery pack, uh, the mass is about 250 kgs. This is a, a mixture of EV and PFs. It contains about 60% cells. And so if there's 3% lithium in there, that's about 4.5 kilograms of lithium per vehicle. And if we take second life into account on recycling, then you know, assuming 100% recycling efficiency, you'd need something like 76,000 vehicles in order to achieve that. Now, of course, you know, this is just the first stage. You then have to do the, the, the hydrometallurgical separation. And then after that, you'd have to remanufacture the whole, uh, the whole cell. And so it becomes very, very difficult to achieve. Um, but uh, the targets are achievable. They're just very difficult. So just to conclude, um, the battery regulations are changing. They're becoming a lot more stringent. Uh, the recycling efficiency requirements are increasing. The recycling targets are being introduced for different metals that go into the batteries. Now, the waste from the gigafactories will play a pivotal role in this. Um, I think personally that uh, just getting the metals from the vehicles will not be sufficient. Uh, definitely the, the waste from the gigafactories will play a major role, particularly at the beginning. And uh, some chemistries are very difficult to recycle, such as LFP, LMO, and um, any new chemistries that uh, don't contain any cobalt or nickel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yep, if you've got questions, I'd like to answer them. Perfect, thank you so much. And actually, <clears throat> um, since now we have completed the first presentation part of this, uh, meeting today. If the other two speakers, I already see Jennifer and Matteo, if you can join me, so to speak, on the stage. And the first question I actually would like to relate to Anwar is, of course, no surprise about um, sustainability of recycling. And this, of course, is a nice segue into the now about 15 minute Q&A that we can afford to have here. Um, the question is, how sustainable is recycling itself? Okay, so th that's a good question. Um, when we ask questions of sustainability, what is a criteria? You know, this is uh, this is a, a very important uh, question to <laughs> ask. You know, what is the criteria? So currently, the when it comes to sustainability, we tend to use carbon dioxide uh, equivalent, and so recycling of batteries saves around twenty kilograms of CO two for every kilowatt hour of battery that's recycled. 
Um, or it works out to be about, uh, I think it's something like just less than two kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of battery recycled. And the reason for the reason why it's the figure is lower than you'd think is because the CO2 emissions associated with a cathode account for about 30%. And you're only recycling the cathode metals, we're not really recycling other materials as of yet. And so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's about 20 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour of battery now. So just, just, just to give another figure, um, currently the world average for battery production is about 120, kilo, uh, 120 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So you can decrease 20 kilograms of that by recycling. Interesting. Um... Jennifer, maybe let's hop into solid state in that regard. How do you think about recyclability and recycling strategies? Because when Umicore and all the other companies that Anwar is in contact with build their facilities for recycling and then the next generation of batteries show up, um, how would that work? That's, that's a very good question. So I think what is very different in solid state batteries is that um, all of it has been seen that at high temperatures. So obviously in kind of like separating that off, that will be difficult. And I think very unrealistic because as I made my funny joke, the best lithium ceramic conductors are those that are most unstable. So you have most dopants in, right? So very bad for recycling. Um, so I would think that it's going to be the whole material that we recycle. So you won't broke it, break it down. Uh, it's probably not going to happen. And I think that needs quite quite high temperatures to separate or that needs to be done mechanically. To tell you the truth, I think that for solid state batteries, this hasn't been considered too much yet. Uh, so it's just in the very beginning. And given the time that full lithium ion batteries are there, I think it's fair to say that um, this is a topic for the next 10 years, right? Yeah. Definitely, because the challenge, of course, is once we establish a recycling stream and circular economy, um, mm -hmm. and then suddenly the raw product is gone, that no more the a certain cell chemistry is being used. Yes. So that's, that's I think, going to be an interesting one. Um, I could imagine that some material classes that are, for instance, glass ceramics may be quite attractive for that reason. Uh, but then on the other hand, a lot of classes have a lot of dopamine. So it's going to be an interesting plot, I think, if you if you map that out, right? So, yes. yeah. Matteo, how do you feel about this? And specifically with the important transition from lithium away. So if you take one of the most precious elements out of this value chain of recycling um, and go for sodium, um, how is that affecting? And, uh, and also, teasing you a little bit, how much of recycling should we put into the consideration when we build the batteries to start with in the, in the cell manufacturing and device engineering? What do you think? Yeah, I think we have to really <clears throat> think, think about that from the very beginning because uh, it's what, what Anwar said about lithium iron phosphate for me was a, was a great disappointment when I learned about it because everybody should be happy that we're going back to LFP. We have a much more sustainable cathode made of iron. And then one day you learn that this means that nobody will want to recycle it because it ju there's just no economic incentive. And that was, I had only one slide on recycling and it was about that because it's really something that struck me when I often try to come up with new materials or design new materials, then is it better than to go with the, the expensive one, the rare ones so that at least will have an incentive not to, to uh, pollute the world with the tons of batteries in the end. Um, I think there's maybe a third way, which is the one that was shown in, in, in this paper and on my slide, which is not only hydro and pyrometallurgy, but it's also direct recycling. So you can basically get your cotton materials out of the cells and try to um, cure them by some, some uh, chemical process, but without destroying them, without having to completely dissolve them and remake them. And that's, uh, in most cases, the only way for materials that are cheap, such as LFP, or that could be some sodium ion cathodes, to be then uh, interesting uh, also for recycling. But this is not something that only the material scientists that synthesize the compound can make. So this is something that really needs uh, discussion and collaboration across the value chain from the material scientists and the chemists to the engineer who's actually uh, thinking about the whole cell design because probably the way cells are done nowadays, especially cylindrical ones, it's really gonna be hard to do a direct recycling. So you need to think of the old pack 
in such a way that you can extract then the cathode on, or other elements. So it's a, it's a great challenge, of course, but uh, I think that's that's the way, in my opinion. So the, the question comes to mind, um, I think it was uh, one of the suggested questions, um, if you would come across a magic wand or a, a rub a lamp and a gin would show up and grant you a wish to basically make one of the key issues that we glance a little bit upon go away, what technological challenge would you have used for most for this magic wand? And that's a that's a very difficult one. Um, well, I guess for uh, especially if we stay in the realm of uh, solid state batteries and solid state electrolytes, uh, I think that uh, improving the the thermodynamic stability of these materials at at both ends would have been really a game changer in terms of simplifying the whole design of the battery. And uh, I mean, everybody was. So excited about these new super ionic conductors and was thinking even they were stable and then it came the realization that actually none of them is and this this brings a lot of complication with it and and of course there's also others but uh this is one thing that i would have uh, wanted to change if i could anwar what would you use your magic wand for um i would say the battery materials, they don't lose their properties over time. And so when they come to the end of life, um, you could reuse them <laughs> again. And I'd be out of a job if there's no degradation of materials. Like. Oh, you, won't be out of, you, you won't be out of a job because you know, you, you'd still be making new materials, better materials. Right. Just that the existing materials, they don't, um, yeah, they, they, they don't break down, they don't degrade. They, you just recover them and then give them straight to <laughs> straight to the manufacturer and then they can redo it. And Jennifer, what is your want wish? Yeah, so Volker, first of all, you, you ask great questions. So I love your way of moderating. Big compliment here. It's fun. <laughs> so my want would go. Um, I, th I think it's not that we don't, I, I disagree a bit here. So to, to heat on the debate, it's not that we don't have the suitable materials. I think we do. The main problem that will decide whether the batteries go big on the market later or not is not the materials, I think, it's really the manufacturer. So I would use my magic wand to um, make very clear that I, I think look into other opportunities how to realistically propose synthesis that can be mass manufactured. And I think that the world is much better helped with that. And one can always write another paper on another material, another degradation mechanism, but that's a real life problem that I think we have. And if I, I think, can use my magic wand to invent 10 more methods that are cheap, um, then I think it's worse than 10 more papers. That's a very good point, but let me jump onto that point actually. And yeah. is that also a strong consequence that unfolds from that for lawmakers? Because mm -hmm. politicians usually um, have two tools. One is regulation to basically say, ah, you need to reach this value. And the other one is throwing money at a problem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And as we as scientists, of course, we are fortunate to receive um, motivation from regulation and support by funding, so that's okay. But still, um, this overlooks the dynamics of the market mm -hmm. and the engineering challenges. So how to approach that? Would that mean that um, a material scientist or chemist in the lab should have an engineer whispering in his or her, her ear all the time, do this, do that? Or how can we streamline from innovation, from discovery to innovation? Great question, short answer, be a great chemist and be a bloody good engineer at the same time and do both. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's, and it's really hard and I agree with you. Um, one thing that I find very interesting about the battery market is there's one of those fields where there's so much money stream in it and so much interest in it that I believe if it's directed in the right way, um, that let's say on average statistically, it will always kind of like fund what the biggest problem is um, because it's not only governed by let's say governance funding. Um, so that's a huge private sector financing as well. And I think they know very well what they need. And I think that unlike other fields where maybe the balance is less in check because it is very interesting to a field of researchers, 
but maybe not so much for application yet, right? Um, that this gives actually some good balance overall um, in the field. And that is what I will say uh, in answer to, to your question. Um, I think that's actually, yeah, a, a quite good balance. But for instance, to me, it is quite interesting that 95% in solid state batteries, if you look in the lab on the processing, is non-transferable to any product. So it's great. Um, we write fantastic papers with that, right? Let's be honest. And we have a lot of fun with it. That's fantastic. But at the end of the day, if I ask myself, I'm now 41, well, when I'm 65, is it better for me to write 100 more papers or maybe only five and solve the real life problems? And I think that's something that each scientist, if you have the luxury and capability to make a contribution here, just question him or herself um, whether the one or the other is better. It's a philosophical question, I think. And I think the challenges, of course, will not stop. But again, looking for impact rather than um, just uh, breakthrough discovery, we need both. Um, when I assumed my position here in Saarbrücken, I actually was asked by a politician, we can buy batteries in the supermarket. So why do we need your research? And I'm like, did you come by horsepower this morning or by a car? And was it a car where you now needed to crank up the engine or not? And um, so this may be, what would you like the, the, the layman, the, 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 you know, so basically the public and also including stakeholders like grassroots movements like Fridays for Future, what would you like them to appreciate about the complexity of the research that we scientists are um, entangled in on an everyday level? What would it be? I, I think that hits it pretty right, um, Volker. And, and I think for everybody out there listening to this, um, you know, kind of like meeting today, right? Um, I think there's great publishing houses that support both. You are allowed to publish both, right? And I think it leads to the whole mixture of that. But yeah, realistically, I think there's still a lot to do for the field, no question. Anwar, how do you feel? What would you like um, regular folks in the bus in the morning or in the tram to, to appreciate about the complexity of what you're doing? Good question. Um, well, firstly, I think uh, communication is the key. Uh, we need to communicate a bit better. Um, I think there's, there's a growing mistrust of science, um, you know, especially in this day and age. I'm not going to mention uh, what... But um, no, I, I, what, what, what we'd like, well, what I'd like them to appreciate is essentially, uh, I agree with uh, what we said, basically the challenge of you know, what's out there. I think if we can communicate to them what the challenges are, then maybe they'd appreciate uh, what, we are, what we are doing. And Matteo, again, people in Bayreuth are difficult to impress if they have the patience to sit through Wagner operas. But still, what would you think the, the people in, in Bayreuth, for example, to appreciate about the complexity about battery technology? Well, I still have to get to know Bayreuth a bit better. I've been here only, only two months. But um, <clears throat> in general, I think I would like to really people to be um, open to, to listen to the science and, and also us. I would like us to be able to communicate this. So also, I assume that we have to do this to try to uh, understand that there's, to explain that there's been great advance and when I speak to people about buying electric vehicles, I often hear that uh, you know people are concerned about uh, uh, the battery dying too soon. And, but that's not even a problem anymore. The, the lithium-ion batteries we make today will outlast the vehicles. So we can make medium-mile batteries for real. And so there are problems that remain, like uh, fast charging, like you know getting even more uh, range and getting even more sustainable batteries. But there are some problems that have been solved, and I think um, I would like really people to appreciate that, uh, and that they can trust uh, buying a really uh, electric vehicle without the fear that the battery will die eventually uh, too soon. Um, yeah, so that's that's definitely something. And and then the other thing is maybe really how, um, but we should try to be humble and. Uh, uh, our discussion before about uh, maybe we need an engineer really whispering on our shoulder. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to do here in Bayreuth because this Baybat is really trying to put many chairs together across chemistry, engineering, but also physics, modeling, uh, informatics, and so on, because there's just no individual that can have all these competencies to cover the whole battery value chain. So we have to be a bit humble, assume that, and, and then 
take it from there, be open to collaboration. And, and I mean, uh, people should uh, accept that we don't know everything. We have to really uh, collaborate and, and bring ideas together to try to make real improvements. And I couldn't have wished for a better closing remark. So since we have already overstrained our audience time-wise a little bit, one more time, thank you so much. It was an amazing experience talking with you gentle people. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't get through answering all the questions that were asked in the Q&A. Uh, I enjoyed it tremendously. I hope you learned something new, exciting. So stay on the flip side, stay excited about science. And thank you so much also for the organizers to bring together this interesting group of people. Thank you so thank much you very for much. having us. And Volker, thank very you much. for this amazing sharing. It's great. The chemical sciences are at the heart of sustainability solutions. Sustainability powered by chemistry.